All right, so we're going to look at the history of psychology, and we're going to kind of start with proto-psychology, so we're looking at the beginnings, and we'll lead all the way up until the beginning of the 19th century, or the mid-19th century, where we have the real beginnings of the actual field that we now call psychology, but we want to take a look at the groundwork that was laid uh, for these 19th, 20th, and 21st century um, psychologists in order to understand where they're coming for, from, we need to kind of see the background. So this is a little bit about the history of psychology. And we should first define what, what psychology is. And it's the study of two things, both behavior and the mind, and really kind of the intersection of those two. How is it that the mind affects behavior or vice versa, how behavior affects the mind? And so to really get good definitions of those is important because that, that really guides our field of study. So when we talk about behavior, we're talking about observable actions of a person or animal. So it must be observable. Uh, and that's kind of one of the tricky things with psychology is a lot of things that psychologists try to study are not actually observable. And that makes things different, difficult. Um, so when we talk specifically about behavior, we're talking about observable actions. The mind is those things that are not necessarily observable all the time. And that is sensations, memories, motives, emotions, etc., etc. Uh, and so these are really more difficult to get down to. And in order to really access the mind of people, we need a lot of uh, introspection. That is people looking at themselves and reacting to what they do. So we need to, in psychology, think about how m the mind and behavior work together in tandem. Uh, or if there are times where they don't actually work together and what problems that can cause. And so thinking about this mind, this concept of memory, sensations, emotions, and thoughts, uh, has a long historical legacy. And that's really what we're going to look at today. So it starts, we're going to start with the, uh, the Greek philosophers. So people have thought about the mind for really a long time, but uh, the best early recordings we have come from the three uh, major philosophers of ancient Greece, and that's Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And so they each kind of have different ideas about uh, the mind or, or where their focuses are going, and these lay the groundwork for later work. So Socrates focuses on like the ideas of justice and the rights of man, so he's looking at kind of innate rights and natural rights, uh, and those show up again in, in, in later Enlightenment thought. Uh, and so he's kind of laying down the groundwork for the mind, and then Plato and Aristotle take it to the, to the next uh, level. And Plato really believes that humans have this innate knowledge that, that we are kind of born with, that we don't acquire from the world, but we just have in us. And that shapes who we are as human beings. And so he's arguing that humans are standing separately because of this innate knowledge, and uh, other, other people cannot, or other objects or animals cannot obtain that. Aristotle argues that truth, as, as he defines it, is derived from the physical world, from our experiences, from our surroundings, and that we are not necessarily born with anything specific or special, but rather by engaging in the physical world around us, we figure out the larger truth and larger concepts. And so those are kind of the two main ideas. Either we're born with it or we learn it from the physical world that will drive the school of study of the mind for the next thousands of years. Uh, and they really focus and argue around this concept of dualism. And dualism, as we classically define it, separates the world into two different spheres. That of the body and that of the spirit. And so when we're talking about the body, we're talking about physical things. Things that can be touched, seen, felt. And we're talking about the, the spirit, we're talking about unseen forces, whatever those may be, however those are perceived. And so they argue that there is this distinct difference between the body and the spirit. And that kind of shows itself again, and there's kind of a modern debate about is there a difference between the brain, which is a command center and it just sends neuro, or neural triggers out, and uh, the mind, which deals with your emotions and sensations. So that dualism kind of, the debate doesn't necessarily disappear. It just kind of shifts uh, into uh, a different way of thinking as we gain more information. So these three men and the ancient Greeks really kind of lay the foundations for uh, thinking about the mind. 
then there's a long time between the end of Greek civilization and the scientific revolution and the enlightenment where very little changes. And that's because of kind of strict theological regulations about what can be taught, what can be said, what can be thought about. But it's also because there's uh, just a dead period in human, in at least Western society where there's not a lot of engaging, there's not a lot of uh, growth of any academic knowledge, in part, again, in part because of this theological shutdown, but in large part because um, society breaks down. And so every man's just kind of fending for himself and in the hierarchy of needs, when you're not feeling safe, when you're not secure, when you don't have food, you're not pursuing higher levels of thinking. So for thousands of years up from, you know, the ancient Greeks, which we'll call it 500 BCE until the scientific revolution, which we'll call, you know, 1600 CE, you got about 2000 years where not a lot's going on. Um, but the scientific revolution really changes all of this opening people to new perspectives, new ways of thinking about the world and the way they engage with the world. And one of the main figures of this is Rene Descartes. Um, and he really believes that there's this set of observable laws and routines that the world follows and that we are kind of actors within this and that we are machines that, that like are predictable. Um, and so everyone you could see in the world, uh, all the animals, all the tides, all the weather patterns were were machines and they behaved in uh, observable, predictable ways. He thought that the exception to this were humans. And he thought of this because humans have minds. Uh, and so this is getting to the concept of free will. And so because this I, these humans have minds, Descartes argues that that is not subject to natural law uh, because it is not observable. So again, He's saying that the observable world follows a set of predictable, observable behavior. And because the mind is not observable, again, we're talking dualism here, it does not follow that predictable, observable behavior. And so he's seeing humans as being able to kind of break out of this machine-like routine. Um, and so he then looks at this mind and body dualism and says that, okay, there has to be some interaction here and that the mind controls the body, but he argued that the body provides sensory information to the mind and then the mind breaks it down, deciphers it and figures out where that's supposed to go and sends out more information. So Descartes really has a really advanced understanding of the way that the brain and the neural system works. Uh, and he even locates and decides that he thinks that this, all of this occurs in what's known as the penal gland. Um, and that is in the back of the brain, right by your brainstem. So he's identified how he believes the mind and body interacts. And then he's identified even where he thinks it happens. Now, Descartes noticed that there were some um, movements of the human body. And he gives them the name reflexes, which we still use today, uh, that are not controlled by this free will of the mind, that are immediate reactions, that are unconscious. We don't actually think about it. And so those are... That kind of challenges his, his argument of this um, mind not following an observable behavioral pattern because uh, sometimes it does when you have these immediate unconscious reactions. But to him, he just said, well, that's not controlled by the mind, therefore we're separate. And so he doesn't really have a full understanding of it, but he gets us moving in the right direction. Next, we have John Locke. And so, again, these are just really important Enlightenment and Scientific Revolution thinkers who were masters at their time and really well-enlightened, well-thought individuals. And so Locke um, continues to build on Descartes' ideas of these natural laws. And if you think back, that is also Socrates' ideas of natural rights and natural laws. Um, and so he applies them even to the mind, though. So he goes one step further than Descartes and says, no, no, these natural laws apply to everything, including humans, including the mind. We are not the exception. Uh, and one school that he's really uh, known for kind of founding and creating and pushing is the idea of empiricism. And so Locke really believes it is necessary to um, have observe observations, experiences, and experiments in order to acquire the truth. So empiricism really comes out of John Locke's ideas. 
And that ties into his next concept that we'll talk about. And that is the idea of tabula rasa, or a blank slate. So he thinks when humans are born, that they are this blank slate, that they have this, um, this blank mind, and that it is filled in through their experiences. And so he thinks that all knowledge does not come from innate, but comes from outward experiences and interacting with the world. So building off the ideas of Aristotle from before. And so because of this, um, he has this idea of empiricism. Well, if we're a blank slate and we need to learn, then we need to acquire truth through observation and experiences. We need to go out and interact with the world in order to start fulfilling our mind. And so he said that nurture over nature as the greater influence on development. That is, the way we are raised has a greater influence on who we are than um, who our parents are, or who our genetics come from. And so he's a real big fan of this concept of moving out and interacting with the world in order to fill in what he perceives as this blank slate. Thomas Hobbes is the uh, next Enlightenment thinker that we'll, we'll look at, and he has a uh, He's a little more negative than anyone else, and, and we'll see that. And so he thinks the idea that whether you want to call it a soul, spirit, mind, whatever it is, is, is meaningless. And he's really uh, a proponent of the concept of materialism. And so he thinks that the only things that exist are matter and energy. That is, things that you see, um, things that you can physically touch. That is, the material world. And so uh, this, this argument about the mind is kind of meaningless to him and so he stresses the role of nature and development the way you are born the that is who you are um, and that is the way you will always be because that is your material that is who you are and so his philosophy um, influences one of the major schools of psychology that we'll eventually look at that is known as behaviorism and kind of looks at how behavior affects people <clears throat> the next major person in psychology is Charles Darwin. And so again, you see psychology pulls a, a lot of its foundations comes from all across the scientific, all across the scientific world. Um, and one of Darwin's uh, seminal works was on the origin of species. Uh, and in this, he has this kind of theory of natural selection, right? And we're, we're mostly aware of this. The creatures have evolved to their present state over a long period of time. So in this argument, uh, Darwin says that physical and behavioral characteristics that promote survival are the ones that are naturally selected, that are naturally chosen, that are naturally replicated. And so um, this is evolution. And so in psychology, a lot of psychologists start pulling this evolutionary theory and saying that, well, there has to be a evolutionary explanation for the way that humans behave, for the way that the mind and body interacts for the way that we have these, um, for the reasons that we have these um, minds and the way they work. And so we see in evolutionary theory, um, it explains the differences between species and a lot of people then use this as justification to use animals for studying purposes. Um, and so that's a whole nother issue that we'll deal with later about animal ethics. But uh, part of Darwin's contribution is not only that idea of how do we select behaviors and patterns and um, that are appropriate and encourage survival, but then also how can we use that to justify the use of animals to study? So it isn't until the 19th century, all of those previous people that we looked at would never have defined themselves as psychologists, and we never would have defined themselves, we would never have defined them as psychologists. They are scientists and um, enlightened thinkers and philosophers who lay the groundwork that psychology is built off of. Uh, but psychology really is founded in the 19th century, and Wilhelm Wundt is often considered the father of psychology. And he is German, and we'll look more deeply at him at a later time, but understanding that, um, that he is the guy who really creates the field of psychology. He's trained in physiology, so he's looking at the physical body, um, but he, he decides that he wants to uh, take this this these methodologies that go with studying the body and start studying the mind with that as well because he re he realizes that the way to understand people is to understand the mind but he wants to do it scientifically because of his background in physiology so he really works to kind of apply his 
physiology background to studying the mind. And uh, out of him, we have a number of um, psychologists who begin to develop this new field. And one of them who brings it to the United States, um, Edward Titchener, um, and him and William James are kind of the two founding uh, founders of American psychology, if you will. Uh, but Titchener really tries to break down the mind. So his goal is to find the smallest elements of the mind. And he, he thinks that as soon as we can get to the smallest element, we can then build up from there to have an understanding of the whole mind. So we got to understand the individual parts. And once we have the parts, we can understand the whole. And this is known as structuralism. And you're about, it's about looking for patterns in thought. And then from those patterns, being able to build a larger picture. Um, and so that is that is kind of Titchener's methodology, start small, start with parts, and work to the whole. But in order to understand patterns and thought, he really relies heavily on interviews with people to describe their conscious experience. So he goes to people and would ask them, you know, questions like, tell me what you were thinking or what were you experiencing or what were you feeling? And uh, this process is known as introspection. And that is where interviewees think about their thinking. We oftentimes call it also metacognition, the way that we think about thinking. And you can understand, and we'll talk a lot more about this later, but there are a lot of potential drawbacks and flaws to this approach. Self-reporting isn't always the best way to gather uh, good data. But in this time, Titchener was working um, with what he kind of had available. The other, as I said, founder of American psychology, William James, comes along and he really kind of approach, opposes a structuralist uh, view. And what he wants to know is, what is the function of the mind? Like, what does it do? Why is it there? And how does it fulfill its purpose? So not necessarily the parts, but the larger overall question of why? Why is it here? What's its point? What, is, what purpose does it serve? And how can we understand it? And so this function-oriented approach naturally gets itself called functionalism. So he's looking more at kind of how does the brain work in humans and what purpose does it serve? And so all of this is leading up to uh, this massive explosion of the field of psychology in the 20th century. And all of the people that we've looked at today are important contributors to laying the groundwork for psychology as we know it today.